Love, listening, and truth. Those are three things that I think our world is in desperate need of more of. Tonight we'll finish up with the last one, not that there aren't more, but the last one of this series. And it's one simple but powerful word, hope. The world needs hope. It's the plot of almost every movie ever written. It's what every person feeds on and fuels on when hope is gone, life is almost gone. So I want to start you off with a real quick, simple question, and I don't want you to look this up. Don't cheat. Just do this with the people you're with. Uh, What's your definition of the word hope? What does hope mean? Take just one second, pause the video, and come back when you're done. I hope that wasn't too hard for you. Now that you've got a great definition, I want to share some other definitions with you. Aristotle said that hope is a waking dream. Francis Bacon said hope is a good breakfast, but it is a bad supper. George Herbert said hope is the poor man's bread. Nietzsche said hope is the worst of evils, for it prolongs the torment of man. What do you think about that one? G.K. Chesterton said hope is the power of being cheerful in circumstances in which we know how to be desperate. Alexander Pope said, Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. And maybe the most famous of all of these quotes is Emily Dickinson's, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. There is poetry in these definitions, I think. Hope does spring eternal. Hope is the thing with feathers. The Bible has plenty to say about hope. Proverbs 13, 12 is one of the most famous hope passages. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. I love the message paraphrase of this one. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. I don't have to tell you this stuff, but hope is powerful. We need hope to live. It's like oxygen. It keeps us alive. When we lose hope, we begin to die. In counseling, One of the most powerful things you can do is help a person have hope. Hope that the situation can change. Hope that they can change. Hope that there is hope. No, it isn't always going to be like this. Hope matters and you know it. Here's what I want to suggest. Despite all of the flowery words and beautiful definitions around hope, most people don't have a Christian perspective of hope. And I think the Christian perspective is even more beautiful and even more powerful. So here's your next exercise. I want you to use a Bible dictionary, a Bible dictionary to look up the word hope. Uh, If you've got one at home, great. Some of your Bibles might even have one in the back. If not, there are a ton online, but I want you to use a Bible dictionary. Did you hear me say Bible dictionary? Bible dictionary to look this word up. Uh, One site you might use is BibleStudyTools.com. There's a button you can click on that says Bible dictionaries. And I want you to look up the word hope. And I want you to read that definition of hope together. See what you can find and see what's different about your definition of hope and a Bible dictionary's definition of hope. Okay, Glenn Buffington's group may have thrown off that exercise a little bit, but 99% of the time, here's what I think just happened. When the average Joe defines hope, he basically defines it the same as he would as a wish. It's a, I want this thing. I'm I'm, I'm thinking this thing could happen. Uh, It's the light at the end of the tunnel, and hopefully it's not a train. Did you hear how I just even used the word hopefully? It's basically wishful thinking, maybe optimism, maybe desire. The way the Bible defines hope is different. This is from Bauer's Greek-English Lexicon of the New Testament in Early Greek Literature, 3rd edition. Hope is the looking forward to something with some reason for confidence respecting fulfillment. Hope, expectation. Now what's really interesting is it even gives another alternate definition. It uses the word foreboding. Foreboding? 
Isn't that like the opposite of hope? Well, it's the opposite of hope in that something that is foreboding is intimidating, it's scary, it's something you don't want to happen. But it's the same as hope in the way that it's something that you expect will happen. The biblical word for hope is not just desire, it's desire plus expectation that will happen. Christianity offers hope that is joyful expectation. Now with that in mind, I want you to try one more exercise. This time I want you to use a concordance or a Bible search tool. Uh, a good one is found at openbible.info topics to look up the word hope in the Bible. And when you read these hope passages, I want you to read them with this definition in mind. Joyful expectation. See if that changes the meaning of any of these passages of Scripture as you read them. I hope your trip through the concordance benefited you. I'd like to share my favorite one of these answers. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah's context is not pleasant. It might be worse than 2020 somehow. When Jeremiah is talking, he's talking to people who are being taken away captive from Jerusalem because the city of God has fallen. The temple has been destroyed. The king has been deposed. Bad, 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 bad things have happened. There are probably even murder hornets somewhere in the story. I just haven't found them in the Hebrew yet. Jeremiah is saying, all of this bad stuff's going to happen. Judah is falling. In verse 5, he tells the exiles, you better get used to it. Build houses, plant gardens, get married, settle in, because God's not coming to your rescue anytime soon. And anyone who says anything otherwise is lying to you, according to verse 9. Well, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet for a reason. He was not a lot of fun to have at a party. This passage, I think, extinguishes the wish that these people had. Their wish was that God would ride in uh, on the whirlwind and destroy the Babylonians, that he would bring them back home and it would all be over right that moment. That wish dies in these verses, but hope still lives. Let me pick up in Jeremiah 29, 10. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. You can keep on reading for this hope to unfold further. If I were living in Babylon as an exile, my wish would be clear. God, come save us. But Jeremiah's instructions are equally clear. He's not going to for 70 more years. Do you know what that means for a significant number of the people reading this letter? They'll be dead before anything changes. For them, their wish ended. But Jeremiah somehow keeps hope alive. Why is this distinguishing uh, characteristic so important? There are a lot of things that I wish for that I will not get. But I can still have hope. I can still have hope in a really broken world. I can have hope, confident, joyful, anticipation, expectation of God's goodness, even if God doesn't solve every problem that's right in front of me. God had not forgotten them. God could have snapped his fingers, and they would have liked it if he said, click your heels together three times and say, there's no place like home, and they transported back to Kansas. But God gave them something different, something Maybe better. There are a lot of things that I am wishing for right now. I wish that we would end our cranky political fights. I wish that the coronavirus would disappear. And I wish that all of our conversations about it would disappear. I wish that there weren't terrorists in the world. I wish that people didn't feel marginalized. And I wish that people didn't feel like their lives mattered less. I wish that our world was safe and orderly and prosperous. I wish that there was no cancer. I wish that all children grew up in happy and healthy homes. I wish that opiates, I wish that all of those addictions and overdoses would end. I wish for a lot of things. 
But you know, not all of those things are happening. Not in my lifetime, most likely. Not in yours, most likely. Matthew, 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 you don't sound very hopeful at all. You sound like a pessimist. You sound like a fatalist. Well, Jesus was honest. He told his disciples one time, the poor you will always have with you. Well, did Jesus not care about the poor? Of course Jesus cared about the poor. People continue to live and to die. My wish is to stop that. But can I tell you about my hope? My hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Just like I told you last week, the truth has a name and its name is Jesus and that the best listener in the world is Jesus and that Jesus is the definition of love. What does the world need? The world needs some Jesus. And oh, that seems kind of annoying for me to say because it's the most preachery thing that I could possibly say. But church, you and I need to hear this and you and I need to believe this, that Jesus is in fact the answer. He is my expectation. His resurrection from the dead says to me that nothing is impossible. Jesus' resurrection from the dead means that there is no wish that might not find fulfillment. Jesus' resurrection from the dead says that no matter what you take away from me in this life, even if it's my life itself, there's no wrong so wrong that God can't right it. If death is not the end, nothing stops my story but God himself. That changes things. That gives me hope. Whether it happens in this life or the next, Friends, there will be a time when justice will roll like waters. There is coming a day when the swords will be beaten into plowshares and the lion will lie down with the lamb. There is coming a day when there is no sickness or death or night because the lamb of God is all of the light of the world. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and everything sad will become untrue. The rightful king will sit on his throne and all of the pretenders will be tossed off. I am confident in the God of all hope. And when I have confidence in that God, when I don't get what I wish, I know that I have something better. I have someone better. Someone who will never fail me, never forget me, who promised never to leave me or forsake me. I won't wish away my days. I won't rise and fall with the headlines each day because I am anchored to the rock that cannot move. I will hold to God's unchanging hand. I can recognize that I don't always get what I want. You know that Jesus didn't always get what he wanted? Do you remember in the garden when he prayed, sweat drops like blood, he prayed, God, please take this cup away from me. He didn't get what he wanted, but his hope didn't die. He knew what was coming next. And so there are moments in this life when I'm going to say, God, please change it. Please fix it. Please, please do something. My hope, like Jesus, can rise from the grave. And because I'm confident in that hope, I can spend my life working towards these wishes, helping people, serving people, sacrificing for others, celebrating life, knowing that there is a future. I can keep hope alive. No, it's really the wrong way to say it. Hope will keep me alive. Faith, hope, and love, these three remain. Of course, the greatest is love. One day, one great day, God will make it right. Peter closes his second letter this way. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let me close with one more question. What are you most hoping for or looking forward to about that day? And how are you living your life in light of that hope? The world desperately needs hope, and so do you, and so do I. How are we living in that hope? Thank you so much for spending this time with me in these last four studies. The world is looking at us to be the answer to the questions it might not even know that it's asking. So will we be people of love? Will we be people who listen? Will we be people who pursue truth, not just rumor and not just gossip and not just when it's convenient? Will we be people who have hope? All of those things we will be if we're Jesus people and the world wants Jesus people. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the hope that you give us. Lord, we don't get what we want all the time and we don't like that, but help us like you. 
Help us love you in just a small way like you have loved us. Give us your strength and your peace and your hope and your joy. Help us see that even when we cannot see tomorrow, we can see you and you know all and you hold all in your hand. Lord, we confess that we often don't like your plan, but we know that you are all wise. We pray for your strength to hang on to you and the realization that you are hanging on to us. Give us what we need, O Lord. Bless us and keep us in your hand. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.